Hello and welcome. Today we're going to be talking about race and ethnicity. It was this subject that really introduced sociology to me in the first place. I was always a psychology person. I have a degree in psychology. I also teach psychology. My PhD is in psychology. Um, and I was all psychology. And I just happened to be taking a Latin American history class one day, finishing up my history minor. And I read the word mestizo in this book. And I was like, what is mestizo? So of course I got on the internet, looked up the word mestizo, and it said European mixed with Native American. And this got me questioning things right away. Because I was very proud of our Cherokee heritage. And I, you know, along with many other Americans, if not most Americans, have some Native American mixed into our genetics. So I started asking the question, am I actually white? Or am I actually a mestizo? And then I kind of started delving deeper. And I started realizing there's all these other races I've never heard of, like mulatto and African Panamanian and Honduran. Yes, Honduran is a race, not just a country. It means mostly Native American. Those races exist in Latin America. You don't hear about them in North America because we only recognize a few races, white, black, Asian, Native American, Native Alaskan, um, or other. So we don't really have a lot of races here. But in Latin America, they have something called the color gradient. Privilege, power, is based upon how light your skin is, okay? So what I'm going to say in this lecture, some of it's very challenging, and it challenges a lot of ideas that you might have about race. But again, that's the purpose of having these conversations. If you want to end racism, we have to have the tough conversation. If we, have to, if we want to end xenophobia, we have to have these tough conversations. Because what I'm going to say might be startling to you. And let's just open it up. First and foremost, we should be questioning whether or not we actually have a race. Are we actually white or black or Asian, for example? Is white actually a race? White, according to the Supreme Court of the United States, is an ethnicity. Okay. Now, there's a lot of divergent opinions on this. The Supreme Court says that it's an ethnicity. However, the U.S. Census calls it a race. So we have to understand the difference between race and ethnicity, okay? And so going into this, race is biological traits. Ethnicity is cultural traits, including country of origin, religion, and common way of life, okay? When we're going to go study race and ethnicity, we have to be asking huge questions, such as, do all people of the same race share common genetics? That's the biological perspective. And the answer is no, absolutely not. Not all black people share common genes. That's not the way it works. Um, how does race affect your brain structure and your cognitions, the way you think? Is there an association between identifying with race and your identity and the way you think about yourself? How important is race to your identity? And then being a member of a status group, a race, how is that associated with your culture, your common way of life? So then we can look at the social context and say, okay, how does race associated with your social behavior and how people's lives are structured by institutions in society? Is race associated with reduced life chances? Is race associated with being stuck in the lower classes throughout most of United States history? And this is kind of where you have the intersection between race, culture, social stratification, and social class. Race was created not because anybody's actually black or white. Truth is, nobody's actually black or white. These are just made up concepts. Okay, why do we make up these concepts in the first place? Europeans, during the age of colonialism, wanted to stratify society into upper classes and lower classes. So they said, what do we have in common? We all have light colored skin. Okay, we'll call everybody with light colored skin um, white. And then we'll call everybody else non-white. Therefore, if you're a male and you're white, you get to have power and have a chance at rising up the social class ladder, whereas everybody else, you're stuck as a lower class workforce. So essentially, women couldn't compete because women had no rights. Minorities couldn't compete of different races and ethnicities because they had no rights. Therefore, the only one who could compete were European-born males. And this is where race comes from. The origin of race is money. It's capital. It's capitalists trying to dominate society. There's no biological basis for race. The purpose of race is to divide society into rich and poor, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the upper class and the lower class, and then to remove competition. 
For example, if you were African American, it was very hard to get capital pre-1960. If you were Asian, they just took your citizenship away. Between 1880s and the 1930s, if you were Asian, they, you were not allowed to be an American. That's how much they had prejudice against Asians. So, again, I'm trying to set you guys up for some probably new ideas, because it was new to me, but it turns out I'm not the only one talking about this. My favorite one is Orlando Patterson, person who used to identify as African American, who's a professor at Harvard. Please look at some of that material. Look at some of the other research on race as a social construct. Look at some of the other research of, you know, is there a biological basis for race? The book goes deep into it. But again, it's a lot challenging because I no longer call myself white. And if anything, I'm mestizo, but I'm American. So really, we're all blended. But the point is, the entire world is blended. Europeans have been conquered by Africans so many times. You know, the Persians all came up and conquered Europe. The Genghis Khan came over from Asia and conquered Europe. The Vikings enslaved everybody. The Romans came up and enslaved everybody. So again, there's a lot of history of blending uh, across the planet. And this, again, it's not the first time we were globally interacting either because the humanity was globally interacting pre-10,500 BC before the ice, ice wall fell. So again, this idea of a pure race does not exist. And again, anytime you hear the word Aryan, remember that Aryan means someone from Iran. So Hitler, for example, and the Aryan race idea, people from that are Aryan are from Iran. When you hear neo-Nazis ranting about the Aryan race, remember, they're basically saying that Iran, that's Aryans, okay? So Aryans are Persians. So a lot of the stuff you've heard is very, very confusing. And the words we use from generation to generation don't make sense. Like, when did Hispanic come into existence? Hispanic is a brand new word. It came into existence in the 1960s. If you call a Mexican Hispanic, they might get very, very offended by that because they don't identify as Hispanic. Where does the term people of color come from? When was that an acceptable term? Is it no longer African-American? And then does people of color include all minority groups? Why is someone from India categorized as Asian? Do you honestly think someone from India thinks they're the same race as someone from China? But yet, the United States encodes them as that. Why is someone from North Africa white? Why is someone from the Middle East white? We need to be asking lots of questions. And again, that's the entire goal of sociology. Is to one, question everything you were ever told, and then go out and examine how things work. And this is how race works. Race was created to stratify society into the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the upper classes and the working classes. It's all about money and capital. Racism is negative attitudes and actions toward minority groups. Okay? You want to end racism, stop calling ourselves black and white and Asian, or at least change the meanings attached to race. Deconstruct the stereotypes. Create a more equitable world. So again, race is a social construction. What this means is two, three hundred years ago, guys, there's no such thing as white and black. Those did not exist. There were no such thing as being black three hundred years ago. We created the categories and then we just created the criteria to determine who falls into what category. But our racial categories do not accurately group people according to biological traits. And anyone going into medicine, you are going to be firsthand at this because you're going to be looking at what the genetic tests say, what the medical tests say. And they say that, again, there is not like all people of one race share common genes. That's not how it works. Race was created for money purposes. That's it. For domination and power, for oppression and privilege and power. Okay, to be of the same race as somebody, you have to share common genetics. And again, this is completely arbitrary because, of course, people on the planet share common genetics. But this is how it works. For example, people from Norway all the way to Africa share common genetics for fingerprints and resistance to malaria. What up? So is that a race? Or is Norwegian African, is that a race? Because they share common genetics. People that share common genes for lactose intolerance from Western Europe to Western Africa, are they a race? Do they share common genetics? Are Native Americans actually Asians? Think about it. Where do they come from? How did they get there? Are they actually Asians? There are no such thing as the pure races. Okay? That doesn't exist. So just remember that we don't share genetic things in common based upon our racial categories. 
There are no agreed upon amount of races or a correct name for races. Again, how many races actually are there? I can list like 20. You only know of like four or five in the United States. But you got to think about it. If you go to Africa, what happens if you call somebody black? Do they get really pissed off at you? Is that a swear word? Because from my experience and in interviewing people from Africa, for example, black is a bad word. It's a swear word. And the first time I ever heard that was from my thesis chairperson who was from Ghana. And he was talking about how he will he's accepting of African American because he's from African American, but don't call him black because that's offensive where he comes from. You know, that's how I feel about being called white. Why are you trying to say I'm different, you know? So again, how many races are there? And then what's the correct name for them? Because it's constantly changing. Is it Hispanic, Chicano, Latino, Mexican? What's proper? I'm African American, black, or the other words that I can't say? Because, you know, W.E. Dubois, the first African-American to get a PhD from Harvard uses a word that I can never say out loud. Is it white or Caucasian? And the first time I ever questioned race was when I was very young. And I read the word Caucasian and I was like, what's a Caucasian? Well, why are there two words for race? So again, is race real? Or is it a social construct, something we made up? Race does not exist in nature, guys. There's no such thing as race in nature. However, we came up with these categories. And because we came up with the categories, the experience of race is very real. The experience of prejudice and discrimination and privilege is very real. If I really need a job, which box do I check? Do I check the choose not to identify box or do I pick the other box? Because again, what color skin do I have? What sex am I? Is there privilege attached to that? If there is, I want to give it up. I want the world to be more equitable. I want women to have a chance to compete. I want people that, of all diverse human genetics, to be able to compete. Ethnicity is culture, okay? Culture, common way of life, which includes religion, language, country of origin. You know, what do you do with your time? The food you eat, the clothes you wear, the value systems, your beliefs, ideologies, rituals, okay? So race is all biology. And so if there's no biological basis for race, we have to deconstruct the categories and either create new ones, which is probably the best thing to do, just for medical purposes. We should know who, sh know who shares common genes because that will help us help people with, you know, tendencies toward heart disease and liver disease and all the other problems that are associated with genetics, for example. Okay. But again, not all black people share common genes. So you, when you, in the medical you know, community, when you control for race, it tends to mess up all the research. Nothing really makes any sense. But if we could better pinpoint who actually does share common genes, we probably have thousands of groups of people that share common genes, but that would help us. Okay. So does race exist? People do share common genetics. But not like all black and white people share common genetics. What's really interesting is this. If you're white and you have a white next door neighbor who identifies as white, is not actually white, you have more in common with any random person in Africa than you do your next white next door neighbor. And you might be confused by this saying, what? My white next door neighbor has less genetically in common with me than anyone in Africa. But that's how genetics work because you need more diversity within groups than you do between groups. It was much more important for two neighbors to be genetically diverse than it is for someone in Africa they won't have contact with just for re reproductive purposes. Now, <clears throat> I want you guys to look at the U.S. Census, and I want you to pull coals in this, okay? Because look, white, Europe, Middle East, or North Africa. Are people from North Africa light-skinned? Are people from the Middle East really light-colored skin? What does a Europe person have in common genetics with someone from the Middle East and North Africa? I'm confused by this. Now, black or African-American, having an origin in any black racial group of Africa, and that's where it gets you. Because it, even if you're in North Africa and you're darker than dark, then you, as long as you call yourself black, you're black. But if you just say you're from North Africa, you're white. You know, so this is where things get kind of confusing. If race is all about biology, why are we including countries of origin in our U.S. census categories? Because this is an ethnic, these are ethnic categories. These are countries. These are not, like, not all people in North Africa share common genetics. With the people that are in Europe and the Middle East, why do we assume that they all share common genes? I, hopefully you guys are questioning that a little bit. And as you notice, this isn't, this is all ethnic stuff. Country of origin, where are you from, or if you have any black racial group. It's very confusing. American Indian or Alaskan Native, 
uh, origin in um, in North America or Central America, Latin America, Asian. But again, look at the Asian category. India is in there. Pakistan's in there. But isn't the Pakistan the Middle East, even though it's, you know, part of India and then they got into a civil war because in race in India, guys, it's, it's Hindu or Muslim. The reason Pakistan exists is because Muslims didn't want to be ruled by a, a Hindu majority. So they had a bit of a civil war. Then there was a trail of tears and Northwest India became Pakistan. And all the Hindus from Northwest India had to move to India. And all the Muslims in India had to go up to Pakistan and Northwest. And then like millions of people died on the way as they were all walking. And because one didn't want to be ruled by another. But again, are these people all the same race? And some are from India and some are from China. And then why isn't Russia in there? Where's Russia? Because isn't Russia in Asia? Doesn't Russia go all the way to the Pacific Ocean? But So why is Russia Europe? Questions. Um, and then Native American. And then I hope you guys notice some other race. You know, there's no such thing as Hispanic on here according to the U.S. Census. These are just others. It's very confusing. And that's the reason I'm pointing this out. Because I want you to be as confused as I am. Because that'll get you questioning things. So again, why was race socially constructed? The history of colonialism. Europeans wanted to dominate society, and they wanted to subjugate all women and other minorities. Um, the Revolutionary War. Okay. Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Hamilton, all of them were the middle class, who were ruled by the Europeans, okay, that lived in Europe, England and Spain. So the Revolutionary War in North America was overthrowing England. Revolutionary War in Latin America was the overthrow of Spain. When the middle class white landowners took over the United States and wrote our constitution, did they include women and minorities in that constitution? No. All they did was overthrow England and Spain, and then they took their upper class positions, thereby continuing this trend of subjugating women and minorities into the lower classes. Again, we had our chance. After we overthrew England, we could have written in women and minorities into that constitution right away. But we didn't. We denied it. All right. So again, aristocratic property owners were able to take the upper class of this hierarchically stratified social system we live in. And no one could really compete with the white landowners. And that's the way America has been ever since. OK, this enabled a lower class workforce. African-Americans, Asians, women became either physical slaves or indentured servants. OK, we created racial categories so we can make it very clear as to who gets to be in which social class, okay? You had light-colored skin, you were male, now you can compete. You're a woman, too bad, you're subjugated to men. You're non-white, too bad, you're subjugated into the lower classes. However, if you had a little bit of a blend, like European with a little bit of Native American, for example, like being mestizo, you could be middle class, like in Latin America. The mestizos, you know, the Europeans mixed with Native Americans got to become middle class because there was a lot more prejudice toward Africans, mulattoes. But a mulatto could also be there, but just below a mestizo, because they had the African instead of the Native American. Again, this is all very prejudice. So again, what is a minority group and what is minority status? Again, it's, think about all the groups you belong to. What type of education do you have? Job prestige, wealth, social class status, capital, social capital, political capital, cultural capital, do you have the right sex, the right race, the right religion? Because again, if you belong to any group and you're, where you're located in that group is a minority position that's dictated by whether or not you have less power over your life than somebody else. Therefore, whites in the United States historically had more power than non-whites, more life chances, more access, more opportunities. Men historically had that. So again, if you think about the sex category, who has power in that category? Males over females. <clears throat> Race, who historically had power? Whites over non-whites. Education, who historically had power? Those who had an education versus those that didn't. Job prestige, who has power and more money? Those who have a good job versus those that don't. Religion, who has power? Christians, who didn't? Muslims, Jewish people. Okay? So again, minority group status is associated with less life chances, and you're being blocked from rising up the social class ladder as a result of prejudice and discrimination. Okay, so for example, the world is 50% female, 50.7, there's more women than men, yet men still hold a status position because of their having more power over their lives than women because of prejudice and discrimination, dominance versus subjugation. Okay. 
Minority status is not always about numbers. But the experience of minority status is very real. The experience of stigmatization because of your race or your sex or your disability status or your sexual orientation, that experience is incredibly real. Racism exists. Sexism exists. Heterosexism exists. And the experience of the stigmatization associated with that for minority groups is incredibly real. So even though race itself might have not make any sense, and nobody's truly white or black or Asian or Native American, Alaskan or Hawaiian or other, the experience of it is very real, okay? Hispanic women make 60 cents compared to a man. Black women make 67 cents to every man's dollar. White women make 80 cents to every man's dollar. So again, why does women in general make less than a man? And then why does an African or a Hispanic woman make less than a white woman? And again, this is all about prejudice and discrimination. It's hiring practices. It's overt, it's covert, it's institutional. Race is an institution. Race does not exist in nature. Race is an institution that we created in society to segregate, to, to stratify society into groups. So prejudice is defined as a negative attitude. attitude. Discrimination is an action based upon that attitude. So prejudices, attitudes, discriminations are actions based upon prejudice. Racism is prejudice and discrimination on the basis of race. Okay, contact theory says this. If you put everybody in the same room and everybody hangs out, racism tends to go down. Prejudice tends to go down. Okay, from a theoretical perspective, again, the purpose, the function of race, the institutionalization of race. Okay, the purpose was to divide society into rich and poor. Conflict theory looks at how those in power versus those in not are competing with each other. So blacks and whites and Asians and people from India have been competing against each other. Symbolic interactionism says this, guys, we're the ones who came up with race. We created the category. You want to get rid of racism, get rid of the category, or at least change the language, the words, the stereotypes, the negativity attached to race, and then socialize our children into a culture that isn't racist, that isn't sexist, that isn't homophobic. When you look at the history of conflict between groups, a lot of it is incredibly dark. Again, so the world is not always a pretty place. Some of it's pretty dark. And so just some of the prime examples of where you see this racial and ethnic conflict based upon genetics or ethnic concerns like cultural basis. The genocide of the Jewish people, not the first time. The Holocaust was not the first time. The Jewish people have been attacked by the Romans, the Babylonians, English people in 800 AD. This did a huge Holocaust in England in like 800 AD. We just don't talk about it a lot. All right. Jewish people, most hate crimes are against Jewish people when it comes to religion. 50%. It's not Muslims. It's not Christians. Muslims and Christians receive the same amount of hate crimes. Um, Jewish people, half of all hate crimes are against Jewish people. Why, I always ask. Because tens of thousands of years of human history. That's how long that prejudice goes back. Same thing with women. Women are the most oppressed of all the minority groups. African-American oppression can't compete with the female oppression except for female African-Americans. Which they have then two forms of racism, so they can totally compete. So I guess that's, you know better way to say it like that. But that's intersectionality. If you get a chance to read Kimberly Crenshaw, and it's the idea of white women versus black women. Do they have the same experience? Well, white women only experience sexism, whereas a black woman experiences racism and sexism. So how is their experience of being a female different? Really cool stuff. Um, that's the Joyner Truth, too, in the 1850s. That's where that comes out of. You know, Joyner Truth, one of the first feminist advocates was really pointing out that white feminists cannot speak for black feminists because they don't understand the need of black feminists. And it's very powerful. So uh, slavery, internal colonialism, this goes way back. Vikings, Africans, Romans, Spanish. I've gone over this, you know, again, a lot in history. Genocide of the Native Americans. Was it genocide or was it just war? Again, because the Vikings enslaved the English. The English have been conquered so many times. The French, the Spanish, everyone's coming up to fight England. And they're just, they were used to war. So from an English perspective, is it genocide or was it war? We gotta ask questions, okay? That's a really good question. Is it genocide? Was it genocide? Hindus and Muslims, again, as I talked about in India. Uh, Chinese right now, millions of Muslims are interned in China. We intern the Japanese, okay? Um, the English think the uh, Irish are a different race, an inferior race, even though they're like literally like a couple hundred miles from each other. Like the English for years have always thought of the Irish as an inferior race. 
Gandhi thought African Americans were inferior to people from India, and Gandhi thought Europeans were superior to people from India, which is horrifyingly shocking. And I wrote in here because there was a great NPR episode about Martin Luther King going to Gandhi's house after Gandhi had died, of course. Um, and, you know, my idea is Martin Luther King didn't really understand Gandhi's stance because Gandhi was a racist. He thought Africans were inferior to people from India. But Indian people think Muslims are inferior to Hindus. So again, a lot of questions. Uh, Jewish and com Muslim conflict going on permanent, per right now. Uh, Serbia's ethnic cleansing of Muslims. Muslims have been, they've received the bad end of the stick so many times. I mean, so much. Right now, you have a lot of Islamophobia in Europe, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing, which is horrifyingly shocking. And they keep talking about how people in Germany, for example, it's like they forgot about the Holocaust. Mm, you know, Segregation in the United States. Slavery in the United States. Again, European attitudes toward immigrants. Right now, it's not very good. We do help each other, too. It's built into our genes to share and be altruistic. However, we are capable of some pretty amazing atrocities that are just dark and sad, and I'm really shocked and horrified sometimes when talking about this stuff. But hence the disclaimer for this class, this is some tough subject matter. It's very tough. It's new. Multiculturalism. Again, guys, we need to embrace diversity. But again, we need to look at diversity not as someone as like distinctly different i mean yeah everyone's got their differences but we're all kind of in the same boat you know everyone's different that's the point we're all uniquely different okay um ending segregation this still happens residential areas schools institutions the friends we hang out with interracial marriage what are people's attitudes toward interracial marriage 1980 there were 500,000 interracial marriages now there's 10 million big changes are happening but still it's not totally good yet there's a lot more room to grow for racism to go away. It is getting better, though. Um, can we maintain our ethnic heritage, cultural identities while not assimilating into the dominant culture is also a big factor. And you see that with the Native American movement right now. Um, just trying to hold on to that. Jewish people have always had to fight to hold on to their culture. So that's pretty important. So some really good questions. Is racial inequality a thing in the past? Okay. Colorblind racism is the idea that, yeah, we gave everybody rights, racism's gone. It's totally not even a thing anymore, which we all know is crap. And you know that because when it goes to hiring practices, the white-sounding name gets the callback for the interview eight times to the black-sounding name. Okay? Progress has been made. An explicit ra racism is rarely tolerated, but again, it still exists. Affirmative action helped but it still hasn't brought up entire groups of people out of poverty that were subjugated into poverty for hundreds of years. White will be a minority by 2044. So by 2044, if everyone just votes in the same way, they can take power from white people no matter what, anyhow. Currently, 60% white, 17% Latino, 13% African American, 5% Asian, 1% Native American, 2% two or more races. Uh, and again, these are just kind of estimates. They're not, they're, they just fluctuate a little bit. In 2011, Latino and non-white babies outnumbered white newborn babies for the first time. So again, maybe white privilege is coming to an end. But again, on white privilege, not all white people have privilege, but they all have access to privilege. Okay? All right. Um, please email with any questions. And I hope this wasn't too challenging, but I need you guys to look into some of the stuff that I'm talking about. Look at the book. Read it clearly. Ask what it's saying. What does it mean that race is a social construction? What do you mean there's no biological basis between groups of people? How does race affect the way you think? How is the social context associated with race? How is society racist? What does institutional discrimination really look like? It's the, the hiring practices. Women, two times every one, you're going to get passed over by a male. So it's that first promotion you got to fight. Thank you so much.